Sup, you beautiful bastards. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. Buckle up, make sure you hit that like button, otherwise we'll punch you in the throat, and let's just jump into it. Dave Chappelle is facing controversy and backlash yet again. He hosted Saturday Night Live over the weekend, people going, oh, what's he gonna say? And the reactions to it, I will say, have been mixed. On one side, you have people saying, oh my God, Dave Chappelle just hosted a masterclass on how to navigate a minefield and hit everybody. But on the other side, you have people saying, no, that's not what happened. He was normalizing anti-Semitism. And I'll link to the monologue down below. It's right here on YouTube. But, you know, he opens by reading a prepared statement where he denounces anti-Semitism. He's like, see, Kanye, that's how you buy yourself some time. He then goes on to joke about how Kanye said he was untouchable and then immediately was touched by Adidas. Big deal. <laughs> he had broken the show business rules. Is this a rule? You know, the rules of perception. If, if they're black, then it's a gang. If they're Italian, it's a mob, but if they're Jewish, it's a coincidence and he should never speak about it. Chappelle also touched on the backlash Kyrie Irving's been facing over anti-Semitism, and they're heading on the list of demands the NBA wanted from him, which I will say is something that even people who have been critical of Kyrie over this whole incident have said, you know, it seems a bit too much. Shannon Sharp's one of the names and faces that comes to mind here. And around all this, Chappelle's saying in his monologue, I know the Jewish people have been through terrible things all over the world, but, 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 but you can't blame that on black Americans. He just... You just can't. Kyrie Irving's black ass was nowhere near the Holocaust. In fact, he's not even certain it existed. He then went on to address people who have argued that Kanye's mental health issues are no excuse for his words and behavior. And there's Chappelle pushing back, saying it is, and also joking about whether or not Kanye is actually crazy. In Hollywood, this was just what I saw. It's a lot of juice. <laughs> like a lot. <laughs> Thing. You know what I mean? There's a lot of black people in Ferguson, Missouri. Let me run the place. You can see if you had some kind of issue. You know what I mean? You might go out to Hollywood and your mind might start connecting some kind of lines and you could maybe adopt the delusion that the Jews run show business. It's not a crazy thing to think but it's a crazy thing to say out loud. In a he then goes on to talk about the election, Trump, and some other things before closing his monologue by bringing up Kanye again and saying... It shouldn't be this scary to talk about anything. It's making my job incredibly difficult. And to be honest with you, I'm getting sick of talking to a crowd like this. I love you to death. And I thank you for your support. And I hope they don't take anything away from me. <laughs> Whoever they are. Like I said, there were a lot of different reactions to this. Uh, there was definitely some criticism, including from Jonathan Greenblatt, the CEO of the Anti-Defamation League, who tweeted, You shouldn't expect Dave Chappelle to serve as society's moral compass, but disturbing to see NBC, SNL, not just normalize, but popularize anti-Semitism. Why are Jewish sensitivities denied or diminished at almost every turn? Why does our trauma trigger applause? And NPR critic Eric Deggan's adding, One of comedy's boldest and most incisive voices had a chance to lend insight to the long struggle black America has had with anti-Semitism. But instead, his monologue seemed filled with justification and minimization. Another is going as far as to call it a meticulous and calculated move to desensitize the population from anti-Semitism, getting society to laugh at Jewish traumas and struggles, and normalizing historic tropes by manipulating the average person's pain and redirecting the reactions onto Jews. And it seemed like people that had this reaction were also more concerned about Chappelle than they were with Kanye. They're saying things like that's because everyone knows Kanye's nuts, but Chappelle posits himself as a teller of difficult truths. We also had people pushing back against that, saying, yeah, there is a difference between Kanye and Chappelle, arguing that Kanye is a person that's lashing out at the Jewish community, whereas Chappelle is is a comedian that's trying to navigate a sensitive topic and with that push lines. And that's in addition to arguments that people are just misunderstanding the jokes. With people pointing to moments in the monologue, like when he was saying, you know, when you see black people, it's a gang. When it's Italian people, it's the mafia. When it's Jewish people, it's just a coincidence. He's saying that the joke is that all of those are bullshit stereotypes. That it's outlandish to see a group of similar people and automatically assume the worst. But that's why with all that, I wanted to talk about it and then also pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts regarding Dave Chappelle, the monologue, and the reactions? What do you think and feel about this and why? Because really, depending on where you go on the internet and social media, you see very, very different reactions. And remember, not only are we going to have a conversation in the comments, your comments may show up on the Sunday Community Show. Which also, if you didn't see yesterday's Sunday show, I'll link to it in the description down below. Gave you a 17-minute monster yesterday, and uh, I don't know, it's, it feels good to have like a fifth video on the channel every week. And then, there's a new king of YouTube. Though, depending on what numbers you use, the new king of YouTube is also the current king of YouTube. 
What I mean to say is that in the few hours after I upload this video, Mr. Beast will become the most subscribed individual YouTuber on the planet, passing the man that he fanboyed over for years and years, PewDiePie. So that a massive passing of the torch, but also, you know, Mr. Beast already is currently the king of YouTube. The guy uploaded a video on Saturday that thing already has over 34 million views. But yeah, massive news for the platform and for one of the future presidents of the United States. And then we've got Elon Musk and Twitter against the government, with Musk yesterday getting into a fight with Senator Ed Markey after Markey asked how a Washington Post reporter was able to make a fake verified account impersonating him. Musk responding, perhaps it's because your real account sounds like a parody. With Markey then hitting back, one of your companies is under an FTC consent decree. Auto Safety Watchdog and HTSA is investigating another for killing people. And you're spending your time picking fights online. Fix your companies or Congress will. With all of that in reference to Twitter possibly violating some FTC rulings that it's been under since before Musk took over as well as an investigation into Tesla's killing people with its auto drive feature. And while Musk, of course, has his supporters, a lot of people supported Markey's stance here. Some also arguing that needlessly antagonizing the guy who sits on multiple committees that regulate the industries Musk is in is probably not a great idea, especially after the Democrats maintain control of the Senate. Musk has already used the opportunity to frame investigation into his controversial companies as possible political abuse, and his fans are agreeing. Though you have the likes of Hassan Piker calling him out on that, tweeting, Billionaires are so brazen about being above the law that they think any matter of warranted congressional action is considered abuse. Though you also had others saying Markey's tweet wasn't really a threat, but rather just stating facts. Because right? it's not unheard of for Congress to intervene when a company threatens national security or violates serious consumer safety standards, both of which Tesla and Twitter have been accused of. But hey, what are your thoughts? And then, right about now, seasonal excitement or dread is really starting to settle in, especially for small businesses. Which is why I want to talk about a sponsor of the PDS, stamps.com slash Phil. When you're running a small business, every second counts and you can't afford to waste a single moment. Right? We're all busy enough as is, and personally, I love how convenient and cost effective this is for me and my business. I can get all mailing and shipping done without even leaving my house. And you can print official US postage from your computer 24 seven, no special supplies or equipment needed. If you need a package pickup, easily schedule it through your stamps.com dashboard. And man, with inflation on the rise, every dollar counts. So with stamps.com slash fill, you get exclusive discounts on post office rates, like 30% off USPS rates and 86% off UPS rates. Stamps.com saves me time and money, freeing me up to spend more time to produce the show, create the brand new Sunday community show, work on the next beautiful bastard drops, and most importantly, actually spending more time with my family and living my life. So this holiday season, trade late nights for silent nights and get started with stamps.com today. Sign up at stamps.com slash fill for a special offer that includes a four week trial plus free postage and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com slash fill. And then drugs are now legal in a few more places than they previously were. With Missouri and Maryland legalizing marijuana. Meanwhile, Arkansas and the Dakotas exposing themselves as narcs by rejecting legislation. But some of the biggest drug news actually came out of Colorado with voters there legalizing psilocybin and psilocin making it the second state to do so. And the vote on this was extremely close with just over 50% of voters agreeing to pass the measure. And as far as some of the specifics, people will be able to take these drugs at state regulated compounds and under licensed supervision. It also allows the personal production and consumption of psilocybin at home alongside DMT, ibogaine, and mescaline by people over the age of 21. Though, key thing, the biggest thing missing here is retail sales, which are still banned under the new rules. Also, other key things, uh, there's no using it at school or in public or while driving, which as an advocate and supporter of legalizing psilocybin, I also agree with. Also, all this is likely going to heavily expand research opportunities as well as let governments look at the large-scale impact of the drug in both a medical setting and any possible society impacts. You know, one of my key takeaways is I feel like this is kind of a sign that just like marijuana, the U.S. as a whole is quickly changing its attitude on certain soft drugs. Because right? while Colorado is a second state to do this, 19 other states have introduced legislation to try and legalize psilocybin for scientific research, including some places you wouldn't expect, like Oklahoma. Over there, it's already passed one chamber of Congress and it's working its way through the other. And some states, like Texas, have already passed similar medical research laws. And while nothing is guaranteed, it's starting to feel very much like marijuana that it's just a matter of time. And then the Dems in Congress not only survive but may actually thrive in a certain way. If you didn't see, over the weekend, the Democrats secured the Senate, with the Democratic Senators Catherine Cortez, Masto, and Mark Kelly winning re-elections in Nevada and Arizona. So that means if Raphael Warnock wins the runoff election in Georgia, the Democrats will have actually gone up a seat in the Senate. While some mouth flappers out there have said, ah, oh, this means the Democrats don't even need Georgia, need I remind you that Joe Manchin is a person that exists. And as we saw over the last two years of the 50-50 split, he ends up becoming pretty much the most important Democrat in the Senate. Where he and Kirsten Sinema have roadblocked a number of things, with one of the most most important things not being legislation, but rather Democrats being able to confirm federal court judges with a simple majority. And that's in addition to providing power and majority to committees. So don't get lazy, don't get high on your own supply, Georgia matters. And then as far as the House of Representatives, as of recording, there is no confirmed majority with 19 races still technically up in the air, but odds are the Republicans are going to have the majority there. But 
even with that majority, it is looking like it is going to be a very, very narrow one, which we may see a result in the more moderate part of the party fighting with the more Trumpian part, with the first big showcasing of that likely being when they pick their leader, right? The, the potential House Speaker. But the front runner is expected to be Congressman Kevin McCarthy, but it's not a sure thing because there are some caucuses that are planning to challenge that. But for now, we'll be waiting and watching. And then, a new report says that then-President Trump told his second White House Chief of Staff, John Kelly, over and over that he wanted the IRS to investigate his political enemies, with Kelly actually telling the Times we ought to investigate and get the IRS on former FBI Director James Comey and his deputy, Andrew McCabe, which I will say is really the least surprising news you could expect around this, though it still serves as a key confirmation. Because as it turns out, after Kelly left, oh my gosh, so random, Comey and McCabe were both selected for a rare, highly intrusive IRS audit. And the odds of both of those men specifically chosen at random would have been 1 in 82 million. Right, so it was an obvious weaponization of the government on two political enemies to anyone really with eyes, ears, and a dollop of common sense. Oh, and it's believed that Donald Trump is going to announce that he's running for the presidency on Tuesday. And then there's child labor in the Midwest, with the Department of Labor recently finding that Packers Sanitation Services, Inc., or Packers, allegedly employed 31 kids as young as 13 for overnight cleaning. The DOL saying these kids were also cleaning dangerous equipment with hazardous chemicals up to six or seven days a week at two facilities for slaughter and meatpacking in Minnesota and one in Nebraska. They were also reportedly getting hurt while on the job, with several kids reportedly suffering chemical burns and other injuries. But also, a key thing is it's not just in the Midwest. You had the DOL filing a complaint with the Federal District Court of Nebraska for a nationwide injunction on Packers, because according to their complaint, evidence suggests Packers may have kids working at 400 other locations across the country. And so the court partially fulfilled the DOL's request and ordered Packers to, you know, stop employing children and comply with the investigation. And that order to comply is a key thing to remember because the DOL complaint also claims that Packers managers have been tampering with evidence right, by trying to obstruct employee interviews conducted with minors and by hiding or deleting documents, text messages, and incident reports. And according to the complaint, the purpose for the nationwide injunction request is for the safety of the kids while the DOL investigates and quote, while wage and hours continuing to pour over records to identify such children, it is slow, painstaking work. Yet the children working overnight on the kill floor of these slaughterhouses cannot wait. Now, as far as what Packers has to say for itself, they deny all of it, saying in a statement to NBC News, they have quote, an absolute company-wide prohibition against the employment of anyone under the age of 18 and zero tolerance for any violation of that policy, period. Also claiming they were surprised by the filing because they said they've been cooperating with the DOL inquiry by providing extensive documents and responses. But hey, as far as what happens from here, there's a hearing set for later this month to see if the order against Packers will be modified, extended, or even just dissolved. And then, Iran just issued its first death sentence for a protester, and many more are now expected to follow. Or as we talked about, lawmakers there overwhelmingly voted in favor of urging the courts to sentence all protesters to death, comparing them to Islamic State terrorists. And with this, stoking fears that as many as 15,000 people who have been arrested during the past two months of protests since the death of Masa Amini could be executed. And while some argue that they're almost certainly not going to kill all 15,000, they have officially charged more than 2,000 so far, with around 750 being reported on Sunday. And some of those charges are punishable by death, including those brought against the unnamed first person to be sentenced. They had been accused of setting fire to a government building, disturbing public order, assembly, and conspiracy to commit a crime against national security, and being an enemy of God and corruption on Earth. Though you also had five others getting the lighter sentence of only getting prison terms of five to ten years for similar crimes. Also, when you're a political prisoner in Iran, that may not necessarily be a much better fate, since reportedly many arrested have witnessed beatings, torture, and even rape. And hey, here's the thing. I am not the utmost expert when it comes to the, the government in Iran, but if you really think they will not execute hundreds, if not thousands of people to maintain power, I really don't think you understand how fucking evil and corrupt this government is. Iran is second only to China in the number of executions each year, having put at least 314 people to death just last year, and then ramping that up and killing some 251 people in the first six months of this year, according to Amnesty International. And that's in addition to the government already showing off its willingness to fucking murder people because of these protests. With Iran human rights saying police have killed at least 326 people since the unrest began. So obviously we're going to continue monitor the story as well as the sheer courage of these protesters and uh, we'll keep you up to date. But that brings us to the end of today's show. Remember, if you missed the brand new Sunday show, you can check it out right here as well as shorts right here. But as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.